World Voices. World Voices is a regular series of readings and presentations by international writers here at the Arts House. And it provides a platform really for writers from around the world, distinguished writers, uh, to present their work and to meet uh, local audiences. Tonight's session uh, is a very special one, I think, and it is presented in conjunction with the Literary Centre Singapore, which is a non-profit organisation dedicated to intercultural communication and engagement across communities through literature. And we have with us four very, very special guests who come all the way from Burma or Myanmar, uh, including one coming all the way from the UK. It's a little down the road. And uh, they're, they're really here to present work, both old and new, from an anthology they recently put together called Bones Will Crow, uh, contemporary Burmese poets, which essentially represents the very first anthology of work by contemporary Burmese poets that has been translated and available in the English language anywhere in the world. Last year I met some of them in London and the UK. I toured with them very successfully. They were fabulous writers. Um, and they recently have presented a US edition of the anthology in New York and elsewhere. Now, I won't be doing most of the work tonight. I'm going to leave the honor to the anthology co-editor, who is himself a very fine poet and editor of the Wolf Magazine for Poetry in London, Mr. James Byrne, over there. Hands up, James. Yeah, that's him. Um, and with us tonight are his three very special guests. Uh, Mr. Zaya Lin, known as the father of contemporary Burmese poetry. Uh, Yandra, over there, who's resident in Singapore and one of the finest women poets from Burma working today. And over at the far end, Mr. Mo Wei, who is a poet and publisher resident in Yangon. Please join me in welcoming them here. So we're going to have about an hour's worth of time together. There will be some readings uh, and I hope a lot of discussion. They will set their work uh, in the context of what is happening right now uh, in their home country. Uh, read a little bit about their work and talk about how their writing relates to the environment that they have to operate in. Uh, can I please invite James to get us started? Hello, oh, good evening. Can you hear me at the back? No, that's good. So, uh, hello, Mingalaba. Uh, how many Burmese here? Any Burmese? Some? Okay. Great, great to see you. Great to see everybody. What a wonderful space for any kind of event, and why not Burmese poetry? I'm just going to um, give you a little bit of backstory about the book, but before I do that, I need to thank some very key people to bringing these Burmese poets here. So I'd like to thank Alvin, um, the effervescence of Alvin as a poet, as an organizer in this case, and as a friend. Thank you, Alvin. It's really uh, great. A lot of work, a lot of emails. Getting a visa from Burma is a very difficult process, and uh, we've all had to collaborate um, on that. So also I'd like to thank Ho Fong. It's, where is Ho Fong? So uh, you have been instrumental also for enabling these events, um, and it means a lot to us, so thank you. I'd like to thank Robin Hemsley as well, he's here right at the front, and he has given uh, through Yale and US program, which just started this week. Um, he has enabled uh, the poets, apart from Indra, of course, who lives here, some um, help with accommodation. So thank you, and thanks to the Arts House for having us here. So uh, this is, I suppose, the official launch of Bones Will Crow in Singapore, and there's hardly been, I think, any uh, literary events for Burmese poetry in Singapore. So this is a historic moment, I think. Um, and it's certainly the first anthology uh, project 
published in the West. And now it's coming slowly, slowly back east. This book that was published um, about a year, just over a year ago, is now starting to have seri serious events uh, and a series of events in Singapore. And it's really great to be here. We've had a, a, a good tour this afternoon in Alvin's car and uh, walking around. And Singapore is um, a great space, I think, to, to launch this book. Now, I'm just going to say two or three things, but before I do this, there are a couple of seats right at the front. There's a couple of people standing up there. There's one right here next to this gentleman who's filming the event, and there's a couple of seats here as well, so you don't have to stand. You'll be standing for over an hour. So, uh, briefly, um, I'm going to hand over to Zayed in about two or three minutes, and he's going to give you a little bit more of an expansive um, backstory uh, when it comes to Burmese poetry, Burmese literature in general, and some of the challenges that Burmese writers have faced over the years. But I want to say um, that the genesis of this project goes back to around 2006. The book took on and off uh, six years to make. Um, what you see is the work that myself, Kukutha, and a few other translators did, but we translated about three times as much as this. And uh, finding out what actually existed was particularly hard because in the West, all I had access to at the time of 2006, the Burmese poet Saul Wei was in prison. Um, and there was a campaign for his release. He was in prison, he wrote this fairly innocuous love poem called February the 14th. But if you read the poem acrostically, then it read something like, Power Mad General Than Shui. Um, so, yeah. so they caught up with him, and they sentenced him, ironically, to 14 years in prison. Now, um, that was all I had access to at the beginning. I'd also heard another poet, Tin Mo, who has now passed away. He actually begins our book, but I didn't have any access at all, even in the British Library, to what was being published in Burma over the last, well, during the time the country had been in isolation, really, so for over 50 years, there was no published literature at all, very little, occasionally. Um, the other thing that I want to say is that I quickly realized that uh, these poets were operating under a very strict regime of censorship. I'll give you an example. During uh, General Ni Win's time of power, which was a long time, um, you couldn't say, um, use the term sunset, because Ni Win is sunrise. So it, it would be like, he's a very superstitious man, it would be like uh, you were killing him with your poems. So sunset was, um, was banned. The color red was banned. Writers could be in deep trouble for the merest thing that we take for granted, particularly in my country and now, of course, here. So uh, it was a, a real learning project. And what I, what I also realized is that the poets had to be highly inventive to avoid censorship. So you get a, a lot of very deeply embedded imagery. You'll hear certain poems tonight, which might remind you of this. Um, in order to avoid military censorship. Also, um, and this is really my last point for now before I hand over to Zaya Lin, um, you had a very exciting uh, new generation. I mean, our book stops with a poet who was born in 1981. But just to perhaps set the scene for our later discussion after the readings, you might want to ask questions about post-censorship because it's been about one year now where there's relative freedom with um, the post-censorship era. And I want us to perhaps think later on, what does that actually mean for the future of Burmese poetry? Uh, now you've got a, uh, this post-censorship era, it's kind of transitional literature, we could term it that way. But certainly these three poets who are here with us tonight, let me just remind you who they are, Zaylin, Andra, and Mo Wei. Um, are three of the great modern Burmese poets. So I hope you enjoy hearing them. Have a look at the book. Um, no obligation to buy, but please have a look at it. And welcome, say you then.
Thank you. I'm very much honored to be here, uh, to be in this room in the old um, uh, historical building. Um, I think if uh, Bones Will Crow had not been published, I would not be standing here in front of you now because um, that anthology, Bones Will Crow, was like the, the introduction of Burmese poetry into the whole world. And so I have a feeling that uh, we are going to be just the first people, you know, and more and more Burmese poets will be coming to Singapore, reading all their poems, and they'll be meeting more uh, contemporary poets uh, in the future. Um, let me tell you something about uh, the history of Burmese poetry. Uh, actually, it goes back to like 11th, 12th century till the um, 20th century, during when Burma was already invaded by, and occupied by the British. And the beginning of uh, the last century, the beginning of the 20th century, was marked by very uh, nationalistic poetry uh, written by um, the Kiko Romain. And that, in, in his classical poems, you know, he exhorted the people to love the, the, the language, to love the literature, and to try to get regain their independence. Then in the 1930s, there were two Burmese uh, poets who went to Oxford University and came back with a new idea of poetry and they called it Kissan, which in Burmese means, which in English would mean testing the times or experimental even. So that was the time when um, a new movement started this movement called this Kisan movement, Destiny the Times. And at that time, you know, a lot of um, um, Burmese poets were against this kind of movement because they were saying that this is not the classical way of writing. But what Mintu uh, um, and what Siazoji, what they did was to bring Burmese poetry into the modern world during the 30s. Then um, during the 50s, a new literary movement appeared. It was called um, 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 Sagete in Burmese, and in English it means new writing. And it was led by the Gomtaya, uh, who is like, um, you may know, Professor Edmund Dambu. So the Gomtaya is like your Professor Edmund Dambu. He's very much respected, very much revered. He's in his 90s now. So he left this, um, this movement, new writing movement, but it was uh, very, very politicized, very leftist, very Marxist. And um, uh, that went on for another 30 years. And in the 1980s, a new, another movement appeared, which was what we call the Kipo movement, or the Myanmar modern poetry movement. So, uh, whereas, Western modernism began at the beginning of um, the 20th century. We first started to experiment with modern poetry only during the 80s. So, in a way, we are rather late. So, um, that, and during the, 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 the 80s, when, when poets like Ang Ching and Wang Chongwe, when they were writing these new poems, of course, you know, a lot of um, people who grew up with this uh, traditional way of understanding poetry were against it, they were terribly against it uh, for two reasons. One was that there was no uh, structure in the poem being free verse. And the other thing was that there was no rhyme. And they said, how can, uh, how can it be poetry if there's no rhyme? So, um, so this modern poetry movement started a new way of thinking about poetry, a new kind of poetics. Then, uh, in 1988, of course, there was this um, mass uh, upheaval against the so-called socialist government, which led to this uh, military regime, which lasted for another 20 years. And um, so, after this military takeover in 1988, this um, this Kipo or modern movement.
movement became even stronger because uh, the military regime too did not consider the skateboard movement as poetry, the skateboard modern book as poetry. They were still hanging on to the traditional idea of poems, you know, which must rhyme. So those who wanted to show that they were against this military regime deliberately wrote in this modern form this modern, rhymeless, treeless verse. And that went on for another 20 years. But, uh, at the beginning of this 21st century, there was this, um, this surge of you know, um, desire to know more about postmodernism. And Siddhar Sozoao, a very um, eminent scholar, introduced postmodern literature and postmodern theories into Myanmar. But the problem was uh, there was this lack of postmodern poetry, whether in Burmese or in translation. So I translated um, quite a lot of them, starting with um, post Soviet Russian literature, Russian poetry, very much postmodern. Um, New York School, John Ashbery, um, Kenneth Kirk, Frank O'Hara. Then also um, going on to um, the Language Poetry Movement by Charles Bernstein, um, um, Bob Perelman, and I couldn't stop there. I went on to post-language poetry, which is still, you know, um, a lot of people are, are still debating whether there's such a thing as post-language poetry. But anyway, uh, whether they call it, you know, uh, analytical poetry or hybrid poetry or whatever, I believe that there is a post-language poetry. So after post-language poetry, I went on to fluff poetry. And one of my uh, fellow poets in Burma, he started this conceptual poetry movement. So we call those uh, new poetic styles and poetic ways of understanding, we call them contemporary. Because we want to distinguish them from this modern kip of poetry. So I consider myself more as a contemporary poet rather than a modern poet. And um, um, some of the poets in Bones and Crow are modern, of course, like Ang Ching is the father of modern poetry, modernist poetry. But the rest are, uh, like for example, Moe, who will be uh, reading his poem later, he started off as a modern poet and he was recognized as a good modern poet, but I somehow uh, made him change to become a contemporary poet. <laughs> but now he's gone back to, to modern poet. So uh, what Omoe has done is, you know, combine contemporary poetics with modern poetics. So uh, you'll be hearing from him later on. Huh? Okay, so um, I'd like to read out my first poem for this evening. And just now, uh, James was telling you about the uh, hardship that we went through due to this uh, censorship, that uh, we couldn't use certain words, certain colors. Um, during the time, censorship was abolished last year, in 2012. And before that, you know, we were not allowed to use the words like mother in our poems, because mother refers to the Aung San Suu Kyi. So you could not write poems about mothers. You could not use the word rose in your poem, because the lady always wore roses. So rose signifies the Aung San Suu Kyi. So we couldn't, we couldn't use the word mother or we couldn't use the word rose, but uh, we used other words of course. Um, so in order to you know, get our uh, poems published, we have to use um, certain kinds of imagery or metaphors that they were not familiar with or ways of writing poetry that they did not consider as poetry. Um, and then this word, history, is of course very much contested and um, um, during our time, that was like 20 years ago, during this uh, military regime, for them history means what they are doing. And you know, we were brought up on Marxism and for us history means another thing. So um, that's the title of my poem, My History Is Not Mine. I'm going to read it in Burmese, but uh, James will read it in the English version, okay? Uh, some of you may not, may have not heard of the Burmese language, how it sounds, 
So, um, okay, there it is. Not a man, uh, not a man, not a not a man, not a man, not a man, not a not a man, not a man, not a Lucy, ma, Sadia, Nabu, Matimu. Do you hear it, Naka Mango? Do you, Matimu? A Mataya, young Sazia, Nama, a Hamashibu. Jamie Zuzia, Matantian Zia, do you hear it, Jamaba? Tell me, Nama Mamibu. Jamsa, I wish you, O Kum Shibu, a Joe Shibu, Pia, Dom Shibu. Not a mind, my ye get up, oh, who? Do you ye get up? Do you get your shinny? Do you ye get up? Do you find the army? Do you ye get up? She won't jay turn down ye to me. A teacher, ma, not been a sap or kick away. Not a dream of a decay, not a jingle to do a ye get it. They jay a chin jay jama. No, a mean Apollo do they jingle. ตกขิตตาเตจินโลเตจินตาอสิตตังเกยาเตจินมาเลยนาหาเนเนไคยะเปียนเดนัมมาปะสยาสาเวสสาเดอะชาวชาดิตุโลปีปีสุสุมะย
find a, a great difference between these two poems. I'm going to read it out in Burmese, and then I'll read it out in English. Confessional to a sissy. Naha, say so we are the shoe look, so so I can't be. Come here, I can't have it, don't put your dog. Now she's she, 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 น้าโลจิเนี่ยผีฤทธิ์ด้วยน้ำมาชีเลยมีคนห้องด้วยน้าอ้านามีบาร์เลยน้าหูเตลูกอยู่ปีนี้เลยสักเรื่องด้วย
on food. I am a student freedom fighter, accused of spying for the military regime and duly beheaded. I can explain. The bomb will go off in the public toilet at 210 shop. However long I may live, I can't testify to all my deeds. I am a cluster of mutating cells at any time. So go ahead, abuse me. I have lost faith in the belief that my lips do utter truth. When I awoke in your bed, you had moved to another one. I feel bad for the old questions I have that cannot give me the answers I want. None of the words I'm spewing out fell naturally from my lips. I keep hearing the breathing of the dead child I buried in me. On my back, I carry the unrelenting lashes of the military regime. I myself obstruct every step I make. I am my own barricade. I was taken out of the infamous insane prison and kicked out of the truck a few miles away. I know these are neither delicious, nor nourishing, nor poetic, just like my life. I'm a poet, ladies and gentlemen, I am a poet. I've been working hard to drown that into your ears. I've enjoyed uncomfortable kisses in my life but I still hunger for a virgin's sweet lips. I've always wanted to be an expert knife thrower in a circus, but I have to keep putting my head in the lion's mouth. I've aged a little, been familiar with a few diseases, gained a few friends, a few enemies, a little wisdom, a few rights, and a little more time to commit suicide. Between the few words that I have and the few cells that make me, many poems have been miscarried. The things I use to construct myself naturally become me. I'm a Buddhist, but what drives my daily life is pure lust. I put myself between quotes once. It was like looking at myself in the mirror. Who am I to be reading this in front of you? Pray tell me. I shed tears for the rose plant I grew that died. I'm totally uninterested in gardening, but I do like breaking down, cow down into bits and pieces. At 14, while doing some sums with my math teacher, I lost my virginity. This morning, I tried to imagine some boundless words. This morning, I awaited the invasion of barbarians into my city. This morning, I take part in a mass rally against the dictatorship, like a flag flying unflinchingly, as I did a few days ago. I'm not afraid of burying my bottom, but don't you ever sit on my toilet seat. I keep getting the sense that some dexterous aliens have inhabited me. No, God forbid, why should I think of you as my male organ? In front of a genitalia, I was an ancient tutting. Tutting, tutting. I don't play any musical instruments, but I've been appreciated for my cunning linguistic skills. <laughs> I consider myself a real gentleman. I fool around at every chance. I know well the difference between a smoke bomb and a fire bomb. I refuse to sell the irradi flowing in my blood to Beijing. Neither will I sell off my dolphins for any problems. I have suffered all the five stages of tragedy to the very depths. I have nothing to confess, and here I'm confessing, and that's my cage. I sometimes mistake myself as the argument, which I quite enjoy. I cheat myself by thinking that I will mate with you all. I may or may not be who you think I am. I may be your secret nightmare. I may be your low-down desire sprawling with maggots. I may be the enormous theory a white horse at the edge of the senses. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I am. I can't say for sure. I am in fact Kim Sarumba, somewhat like your Merlion, but more. A mythical beast with body parts cobbled together, trunk and tusk of the elephant, head of the lion, body of the horse, wings of the hinder, and tail of the machine fish. 
with each of my parts wanting to be dominant, you know nothing of identity crisis. Being an airy creature thus, I leave my footprints in the air. Thank you. And the last poem I want to read, story, I think, is by uh, Ang Cheng, like I said, the father of police modern poetry. In fact, uh, Ang Cheng was like our mentor. You know, we grew up to learn to write poetry by reading his poems. And this is one of his epic poems written in 1975. I'm going to read that verse. Uh, it's called Ang Che Goes to the Cinema. Ang Che Yo Xin Ji Jin. Bang Wu Ma Chi Chin the Book, Jai Hale. A little bit of Jim Shin, Oago, Pepe, Tai Mia, Tia Gang Hu Kosovari. สาวตัวมาก็ซาเสียทุกข์เอาอย่างนี้กบาเยมีจีอาลุมาซาตัดมีจีไซเกลโลเดอุ้ยเดมาลูเตอลาโหพี่โอจ๋าเดเยเวซ
I'm now going to introduce Mo Wei, and I'm probably going to read, uh, he's going to do what Zay Lin did, which is to read a poem by another author in the book. He's going to start with a poem by Mong Piet Min. Please come. And let me just say a few things about Mo Wei. Mo Wei was born in 1969 um, in a hamlet in the Irrawaddy Delta, and he now lives in Yangon. Um, he made his literary debut back in 1991, and soon after this, he published collections, um, The New Form of Life, uh, a great title, this one, Now He's Rough, Now He's Soft, that was in 2009. And he's now considered uh, not just one of the great Burmese modern poets, but also, as Aileen said earlier, one of the major publishers, one of the only publishers consistently of modern poetry in Burma. Please welcome our way. Uh, 
Reserve these for the others with a similar condition. Car key for a car, free car for a free rider. A key is not a toy. Wait, let's begin at the beginning. Let's peep through the first keyhole. This key doesn't fit.
Forgiving, forgive me for not being able to wrinkle out all the differences. What have I really done to serve myself? As you see me now, I stand alone, all alone, exposed to the weather. Please try to understand me. I have never betrayed you. In fact, I am doing this not because I am too much in the business of representing you. I am doing this because it is my inherent hobby. Life has dictated me to represent the majority. That's why I am standing in front of you all, just to be misrepresented, just to be walked on. A few of you may have developed certain prejudices against me. I know, but I am sorry. I work for the majority. Pleasure is not even part of my leisureliness. Both my soul and my body are very busy representing the majority. From my position of genuine goodwill, I do not expect anything in return. With a clear conscience, I do what I have to do. I, the chosen one, am determined to realize my true calling, the purpose of my life. Trust me. Trust me. Please trust me. I represent the majority. Sambu Pendamia, 
uh, bringing up the, our first ever anthology so Bamis poetry to the abroad country. And that's special thanks to James. Then, I want to, yeah. Yeah? No, I'm very proud and I am very delighted to get this round opportunity of to stand here and read poetry together with our great poet Seya Ziyalin in Seya movie. So thank you so much. Now the poem I'm going to read now is the Lily. I want to now I'm going to sub video to you all. Actually I have sub already the video with Jay as the whole England, uh, London, the 2012. Now, for this is the time of the Singapore, Singaporean. So, please taste the beer that I'm going to sell on Lily's behalf. Thank you so much.
Prince called Lily. Lily flutters her dark, wavy eyelashes from her long, ivy hair, from her cheeks, from her neck. A bunch of rainbows bloom in the middle of the night. Her thin top curvy and bent, her mini jeans torn and tight. Lily serves beer. Lily cringes more than necessary. Lily comes close more than necessary. Lily mixes herself appositely. Lily has her own recipe, cultures her own yeast. Lily cooks the pose of a she-cat in a pencil heel for an appetizer. Lily walks the glass bead strings on her pearly breasts into munchies. Lily's black irises are like a virgin crow stalking its prey. Lily moves like meatloaf about to be snatched by a hawk. Lily serves beer. Lily promotes beer with her scent. Lily promotes her scent with beer. Lily serves beer. Amid the buzzings of rowdy blowflies, lusty looks fume as Lily uncorks the syrupy sweet laughter. Pop! Lily pours her froth of giggles to be forked at, gummed and swallowed. With cloudberry lips, Lily serves. Lily's nonchalant smile pierces their stares. Lily serves. Lily knifes words with her gavel. Lily serves. Lily wants to flow in their arteries. Lily serves. Lily serves, like a shaggy she-terrier cajoling. Lily smashes herself to fit into a bottle for her masters. Lily serves. Lily, her face uninterested at the news of homecomings. She transplants her life branch to branch to serve another beer. Lily the bait. Lily the cheery fisherwoman who chaffs. Life is bitter. Life is beer. Lily serves another beer. I am God's glitch, she serves. I am a tiny she-snake from the wicker basket of the snake charmer, she serves. Because it is not bedtime yet, another. Because on Lily the nights pour down, another. Dawn unbudded, where the darkness lingers, where the day is yet to shed new light. Lily serves fear. Lily has just served. Lily is serving. Kijoye, lu music kwa tega la, 
ತುಂಬಾ ಉಮಾನೆ ನೀವಿದೆ ತುಂಬಾ ಉಮಾನ ಕಿವಿದೆ ತುಂಬಾ ಇನ್ನೆ ಲೇಲೆ ಜುಗದಲ್ಲಿ ತುಂಬಾ ಜೋಸಿನ ಮುಸಿನ ಬಲವೆ ತುಂಬಾ ಮೋನು ನಂಗ ಬಲ ನ್ಯಾಸನೆ ತುಂಬಾ ಲಂಜಿಲ ತುಂಬಾ ಡಂಜಿಲ ತುಂಬಾ ನಲವಲ ತುಂಬಾ ಜೋಸನ ತುಂಬಾ ಟೋನೋಮ ತುಂಬಾ ಇ ಮಾಪಾಯೋವೆ ತುಂಬಾ ಯಂ ಸಂಗಾಗೆ ರಾಲೆ ತುಂಬಾ ಬಾತಾಸ್ ನಾ ಬರನಿ ಉಲ ಉತ್ತದಲೆ ತುಂಬೆ ನಿ ಯಾ ಹಾನಿ ಜೌಲಾಗಲೆ ಜಿ ಕಟಿಯೆ ಯೋ ಸಿ ಮೇ ಸಿಗಾಲ ದೇವಾ ಬಹುವದ ಮಾಯೆ ತೇರಸ ಸಿಗಾಲ ಸೌಜಾನೆ ನೇಗ ಜೇನಂ ಚುಚಲಿ ಸಿಗಾಲ ಅಥೆ ಜುತ ಮಾಲಿಯೆ ನೇಮು ಯಾದ ಸಿಗಾಲ ನೇಯೆ ಬೌ ಜಿ ಮೇ ಸಿಗಾಲ ಅಕೊಂಡೋರೆ ಸಿಗಾಲ ತಬಾವ ಜಿಂಗೆ ಬೇ ಸಿಗಾಲ ಕಯುನಾ ಜಿ ಸಿಗಾಲ ಪತ್ತಾ ಸಾಜೋ ಬೇ ಸಿಗಾಲ ಯುಮು ತಪಾಯೆ ತೇಪೋಯೆ ಸಿಗಾಲ ಬೇಗ ನಾದಲೆ ಬೇಗ ತೋಮಾಲೆ ಬೇಗಿ ಯಕ್ಕದಲೆ ಬಲು ಶಿಸಂದೆ ತುಮ ಸ್ವಚಿನಿಯ ಆರಿಲೆ ಡಸಿನೆ ಡ್ರೀಬಿ ಶೇವಿ ಜೋಶಿಯಾಲ ಮರಿ ಜೆನಿಯ ಟೋವೋ ಸಂಜಲ ನಂಚಿ ಬಾನೆ ಜಾನೆ ಹಿಂಗೆ ಸಿಕಾನಿ ಸಾಬಿ ಜಾಯಲ ತಪಾಯೆ ಡಸಿಸಿ ಜಾಯಲ ತಪಾವಾಲ ಅಸಮತ್ಯ ಜಾಯಲ ಲುಬೈನಿಯಾ ಜೀ 
Chiang Dinuyang, Lele Tuanai. Maharan Rangi Go, Kukka Petate, Tura Jian Miluji, Miyujiga, Wanda Aya, Mure, Mountainai. Joma Uyado, Ni Wanyane, Nijiti, Mure Debu, Joma Lujinari, Jangani. Lubeiruya, Sizae Najobu, Tane Tore, Antonina, Mimone Tioyo, Bruce Najobu, Tane Tadubi, Siza, 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 Luk, Tongi Doga, Kitui Lajani. Lubeyoga, Swagala, Linswa Kubuki, Makuzawe, Painswero, Lubei Parasa, Legani, the Sin Kusete. Lubei was in Chitane, Ubong Puji, Niname, Paya Kuboka, Sakalonia, you see me. Now go, Nasalina, you dream, no one, Paintwara, I mean. Lubei go, Bowen, to Nebo, Lubei Niga, the rain and then three day, Shana Yajari, Thorne Kajari. The Chilene, Lubei Uyga, Pua Pua Laro, Lubei Mahotuiga, Lubei Yam, Sami Jayari. Lubei Jibo, Lubei Lancho Bo, Lubei Wasa Sinbo, Lubei Lolo Bo, Lubei Samo Eko, Lubei Kunjuta Sazi Saeko, Lubei Tashinine, Lubei Ne, Lubei Marina, Kwelura Miyano. Taylanaga, Kanaka Nimo CP, Lubei Lo Kiyabo, Totra Doyare, Yan Lipuin Bima, Kianabi, Lubei Nuye Shinaga, Payama Masso Yari, Tepe. ဟောရတယ်လို့ရတယ်လူဘိတ်တွေတွေတဲ့လူဘိတ်တွေနားတယ်ဟိုလူဘိတ်ချက်တရားဟိုဘာရှင်းတင်းချပေးရတယ်
On the back of the horse Kanaka, the prince Siddhartha followed the ascetic path to shun the Daft. He came back after the Great Awakening. He confronted the Daft as the Buddha, the emancipated, for the Daft thinking Daft. The Dharma preachers have had to downgrade their Dharma versions. The preachers died preaching. The Daft have crucified Jesus Christ. The Daft have assassinated Lady Diana. They have flattened the jungles in search of Marilyn Monroe and Michael Jackson. They have snapped Tiger Woods' wood. They have scrambled the Socrates' poison cup. In anonymity, the Daft have decided to pronounce anonymity in an issue. They have decided to make do with cakes whenever bread is not available. They have driven a man and his horse and, and his son and their mule out of the village. They have moved the Statue of Liberty to Baghdad. They have ordered an atom bomb from Einstein and they have made a knife mark on the rib of their boat. As the daft from all corners of the planet are enjoying themselves in their merry-go-rounds, boom! The sky is collapsing, the deafening noise, the daft in uproar, the daft in commotion, the daft chaos, the daft stampeding. Except in the title, 
in the title is the only spot that I caught that the customer is condemned, um, where they're supposed to piss in the other room, um, which is a condemnation of the